Hello and welcome to Dialogue Sunday Gospel Study. Um, today, January 23rd, 2022, with Jana Reese. For purposes of tracking with Sunday School, we are working today with chapters 5 through 11 in Genesis. Although, as usual, um, Jana will, will pick what she wants to. But we, uh, I, I mentioned that because it roughly corresponds with the late January and early February readings for the Come Follow Me program. Um, I'm Chris Kimball, conducting the day on behalf of the Dialogue Foundation Board. Other board members, Michael Austin and Rebecca Deschweinitz, are part of our group. Michael Austin, more in the foreground today than usual. We're using our webinar format on Zoom. We're running a live stream on Facebook and recording this program. For viewers on Zoom in particular, there is a chat function by which you can comment, ask questions, and propose answers. We'll also try to follow comments on Facebook and introduce questions from both when, uh, when appropriate. I am uh, I am glad you're here today with us for this program. I'm, I'm sobered by having uh, 10 minutes before we started received news that a, that a good friend is on a ventilator um, with COVID and I'm... I'm uh, <sighs> I'm down a little about that, but I am uh, hope that you are all well and glad that we can have this time together um, in, in uh, better isolation. With respect to dialogue, let's move on. Um, in the first issue of the journal, founder Eugene England wrote, my faith encourages my curiosity and awe. It thrusts me out into relationship with all creation and encourages me to enter into dialogue. Uh, that's what we are doing with this program and with the rest of the journal and all that we do with dialogue. To fulfill this vision, in the 21st century, we've made the journal, all 54 years of archived issues and all of our new digital offerings, including this gospel study series, our podcasts and other features entirely free for online users. We've moved from a subscription model of funding and we're in the process of building a sustaining dialogue fund to carry the journal and associated offerings, offerings into the future. We ask for your help in creating this fund. You can find more about sustaining dialogue at give, give to dialogue.com. Now moving to our uh, program today, I'm pleased to introduce Jana Rees. Jana is a senior columnist at Religion News Service and the author of many books, including The Twibble, all the chapters of the Bible in 140 characters or less, although we expect more than 140, 140 characters today. And The Prayer Wheel in 2018 and The Next Mormons, How Millennials Are Changing the LDS Church in 2019. She is working on a sociology book with Benjamin Knoll about why and how people leave the LDS Church. She has a PhD in American Religious History from Columbia University. She's a Ward History Specialist and a Relief Society teacher in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, as a disclaimer, with every speaker and participant, we say the same. We've invited Jana today for her personal insights, for her own voice. She does not speak for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, nor for the Dialogue Foundation. For our program today, our opening song will be Schaffe in mir Gott an Rhein Herz, which is Create in Me a Clean Heart, O God, by Johannes Brahms, performed by the Dresdner Kammerchor. The text is drawn from Luther's translation of Psalms 51, 10 through 12. And in, King, in the King James English, it reads, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Our opening prayer will be by Catherine Pritchett. Catherine is a writer and dialogue contributor living in Oakland, California. She fondly recalls hosting Jana in a Bay Area book tour visit where they shared a surprise Oakland State Conference visit from President Russell M. Nelson shortly after he became president of the church. And our closing prayer will be by Stan Soper. Stan Soper is a graduate of BYU and Yale Law School. He is a business lawyer and entrepreneur. 
he was introduced to dialogue by Eugene England himself, who was his advanced writing teacher at BYU. Dear Heavenly Father, thank thee for the opportunity to gather even in our isolation. Please bless those who are suffering from COVID at this moment and bless those who love them and grieve with them. Thank thee for our dear sister Jana Reese for her work that is helping us to make sense of where we are now. May it help us move forward in ways that will nurture and strengthen our church communities and each other. We ask thy spirit to be with her that she may say the things she would like to say. Please bless us as we listen to her message that we might have ears to hear what needs to be heard. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Uh, there we are. Amen. And thank you. And welcome, Jana. Uh, you're on. Okay, great. Well, welcome to everyone who has been joining us. I'm going to share my screen. So our passage uh, is Genesis 5 through 7. If we wanted to be super, super grandiose, we could also try to do uh, the rest of the Noah narrative, which extends past this. But I think we have more than enough to be going on with, as Dumbledore would say. So we've got plenty of material here. Um, I'm really delighted, actually, that the church includes Genesis 5 in its curriculum at all, because this is not necessarily one of the greatest hits passages that a lot of people cover. And I do think it's important for reasons that I'll outline in a moment. Uh, here we have the opening statement of Genesis 5. And so take a look at that, particularly this issue of being created in the likeness of God and then be, being created male and female, because both of those things are going to come up again when we get to the Noah cycle. Um, so we're not going to be talking about Moses today and the, the parallel readings from the book of Moses that are part of this lesson in Come Follow Me, but I totally encourage you to go ahead and look at that on your own because it is really interesting to compare the texts side by side. So Genesis 5 is essentially a genealogy. So before you start yawning, uh, let me just promise that there are some interesting nuggets in there that we're going to dig into do that first, and then spend a really very brief moment on what I consider a pretty disturbing passage in the Hebrew Bible Old Testament. This is uh, not going to take up a lot of time, but I think it's important because it sets the stage for what will be coming with Noah. So we'll take a little break in the middle, and Michael and Rebecca are going to field questions through the chat function. So feel free anytime that I'm speaking to go ahead and put your question in there or your comment and we can take a break in the middle to talk about them. And then we will get to Noah, or at least the first part of the Noah narrative. And another lesson I see later in Come Follow Me will pick that up. So that's our plan. Whether we'll be able to cram all this into basically half an hour, we'll just have to see how this goes. But I'm going to try my best to cover a lot of what I consider to be interesting material. So uh, my two main sources that I turned to in preparation here are Walter Brueggemann's commentary on Genesis, which is great, and part of the interpretation series uh, from Westminster John Knox, my former employer. So there's a plug for WJK. And then over here, I have Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg's book, uh, Commentary on Genesis, The Beginning of Desire. So this came out in 1995. It won the National Jewish Book Award in 1995. And I think that Zornberg is one of the best commentators that we have going. So if you take nothing away from this uh, lesson today, other than go and check out her books from the library or buy them wherever, because they are so insightful. So um, she has been spending essentially three decades going through the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. So the Genesis commentary started it off. She also has one on Exodus, which may be helpful to you when we get to that part of the curriculum later this year. This one, Leviticus, a little bit out of order, is actually just about to come out. Zornberg only writes a book every five to 10 years. Uh, she's, she's a very careful writer and thinker. She's not one of these people that's turning out a book every nine months. And so, you know, this is eagerly awaited. I never thought that I would be the person who said that I'm eagerly awaiting anything about the book of Leviticus. 
But if she's the one writing it, I am totally there for it. And I've already pre-ordered it from Amazon. And then she has this one on numbers, which I'm planning to read later this year. I've not read that one, but I think if anyone can rescue the book of numbers in my mind from a cesspool of violence, it would be Zornberg. So, and then this final one. Um, she also has a biography of Moses that I have not read, but it has gotten excellent reviews. That's from Yale University Press. And that could be also really interesting for you when you're getting to the Exodus stuff. So, but for right now, let's think about Genesis 5, 6, and 7 and what she has to say there. Okay, so a while ago, I decided that it would be a super fun idea, uh, not having much brains to speak of, to do the entire Bible on Twitter. And I didn't quite realize that there are 1,187 chapters of the Bible. And if you're tweeting one out every day, that's essentially three and a half years of your life, plus tweeting other things related to the Bible. So this was really a four-year project, and then it was all gathered up into this book. I didn't really know what to make of Genesis 5 at the time. As you can see here, I'm drawing on a commentator who says that uh, the point of Genesis 5 is to demonstrate that human history is getting worse and worse and that human beings are uh, becoming more sinful over time. And except for this wonderful Methuselah, this is where we get that. I'm sure you already knew that, but the idea of as old as Methuselah. So I wanted to see what this looks like. And I discovered in creating a bar graph about this, because that's the nerdy thing to do, that that interpretation is not really correct. It's more complicated than that. It's not simply a question of this chapter demonstrating that humankind is becoming progressively more sinful uh, through these abbreviated lifespans. I mean, if we can call abbreviated that you're only living to be 777 years, boo-hoo for you. Um, so we are seeing some of that trend with the first five people. And then it gets a little wonky. We see Jared has a nice long life. Methuselah, of course, has a nice long life. Enoch has a very short life, but, but that's not because of his sinful nature. That is because actually of the opposite. And God swoops Enoch, Enoch up, as you probably know from the book of Moses. Uh, and then the point of this is to get us to Noah. So a couple of observations here. The first is that between Adam and Enoch, Adam was still alive when Enoch was born. If you read, you know, if, if putting aside this whole issue of is any of this going to be interpreted literally, et cetera, that's not a question that I'm particularly interested. I'm, I'm just interested in what is the story trying to tell us? And I think one of the things that the story is trying to tell us is that there is this kind of progressive sense of declension that Adam is still around and seeing what is happening with his descendants. It kind of reminds me actually a little bit of Nephi in a vision, seeing what is going to happen with his people. But Adam is actually right there, literally on the ground, because his name means ground, uh, seeing this happen. So he is watching what happens with his descendants. Seven generations between Adam and Enoch. Uh, the number seven, as I'm sure you know, is highly symbolic in the Bible. So that's Take take that what you what you will. The second thing I want to point out down here: where does the flood happen within the lifetime of Noah? And Noah is six hundred years at the time of the flood, so this is about two thirds of the way through his life. He's had his kids. He is you know a, a respected middle aged Old Testament patriarch by this point. And the flood is from when he's 600 until he's 601. He's in the ark for about a year, which is not exactly how we tend to tell the story. We have the abbreviated American version in which everything happens in a condensed 40 day time period. That's not actually what the Bible says about it. Uh, so the fact that you know we've all been cooped up for a little while now and we have a tiny sense of what that might have been like if we want to psychologize it, and maybe we're not exactly our best selves in that environment. So hold on to that thought. All right, so this is a point about Genesis 5. We wanna say that people are not only having these amazing lifespans that seem incredible to us, 
but that they are enmeshed in each other's time spans in a way that we don't necessarily think of. And I think that that's a kind of a key observation. Again, this is from Zornberg. All right. A couple of points to note here. Remember at the beginning, and I said, take a look at that language in the beginning of Genesis 5, because it's reiterating what has happened already at the beginning of Genesis. So God creates humankind in the likeness of God. So we're in the image of God and male and female, he created them and he blessed them. So that's something to keep in mind as we move forward. So this, this uh, beginning of the genealogy goes out of its way to, to settle this all within the larger context of God creating Adam and God creating human history and saying that human beings are good because you know what's going to follow is going to really challenge that perspective that human beings are somehow inherently good and created in God's likeness. The other thing that comes up again and again is that Noah is being presented as the new Adam. So Noah, uh, Lamech, his father, names him Noah, saying, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the toil of our hands. So remember I said that that Adam or Adam, that's a pun on ground. You might've covered that already in dialogue. Uh, so saying that Noah is going to be coming out of the ground is a, is a very direct allusion to Adam and to the creation of Adam. And remember that the curse that was given to Adam and Eve after the fall was twofold. So Adam is cursed to toil the ground, to till the soil, to have uh, to labor for bread. Eve is cursed to have pain in childbirth. So remember those two things because they will come up again a little bit later in the Noah narrative. All right, so this is Zornberg again, and she's pointing out something about the beginning of Genesis 5. So if you take a look at the bottom here, this is verse three of chapter five. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his likeness, according to his image and named him Seth. So what Zornberg is taking from this is that this is actually a perversion of creation. That here we have human beings replicating themselves it's not necessarily that human beings are having children in the image of God, or that becomes indirect. What they're doing instead is having mini-me's, and that's not what God originally intended. And she is making the point that it is uh, distorting the image of humankind when this happens. Okay. The name Noah, names are very significant in many places in Genesis, and this is no exception. And she is talking about how there is an explosion of puns, and she also says a flurry of puns throughout these chapters. Noah, as a word, is related to words like comfort, relief, and also rest, which I probably should have listed here. But it can also mean regret. And that, she says, indicates a radical revision of the Adam project. So this is a case in which God is having second thoughts. God has created humankind, maybe didn't turn out quite the way God planned. And so the question is what's going to happen now? How will God respond to this if human beings are not quite the children that God had anticipated? All right, that's all I want to say so far about Genesis 5. Let's take a look briefly at this beginning of Genesis 6, uh, verses 1 through 4. This is where we have, when people began to multiply on the face of the ground, daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. The sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them. This passage has become the focal point of a lot of fantasy fiction, and I'm a big reader of fantasy fiction. I don't know if anyone else out there enjoys this, but in the popular imagination, these, these beings, Nephilim, are kind of demigods or 
or fallen angels or even angels themselves. And the Bible doesn't actually tell us any of that. So it's a wonderful kind of midrash on what Nephilim might be because the Bible itself is very mysterious about it and it doesn't necessarily come to any conclusions. I find this passage very disturbing and especially because it sets up what's going to happen in the Noah narrative that follows immediately because what happens immediately in verses five and following is that we find out that humankind is sinning terribly, that everything has gone to crap and that God is really upset about what has happened with human beings, that they're violent, that they're you know, having unlawful sex, that they're doing all these things. They are um, bloodthirsty. Well, is that what is being set up here in this passage? I, for one, just want to put in a little plug that I don't think human beings are getting a very fair shake here. And what I've done is uh, <laughs> highlight the, the active resume verbs of the Nephilim here. They're the ones who are doing all of the choosing. The sons of God saw that these women are fair. They took wives for themselves of all that they chose, and then they went into the daughters. There's no mention here of consent. There's no mention here of anything that human beings have done or wished for or prayed for or in any way invited that would make this particular passage so problematic as it seems to be. And I think this is one of the mysteries of Genesis and how it, this particular part of Genesis is structured. We've got tons of sin in Genesis, right? We have a lot of human-made sin throughout the book, uh, not just starting with the fall but the first death in the book of Genesis is a murder. Um, and we've just had that in chapter four. So it's not like there isn't sin to choose from, but why is this the immediate precursor? Why does this immediately precipitate the fall? Because it does not sound like this is something that human beings chose for themselves. And I think that's one of, I don't have an answer for you, but I think that's one of the important questions about this. To what extent are human beings responsible if this is supposed to be the, the terrible, horrible thing that happens immediately before the flood, the thing that is just God's last straw, but human beings did not initiate it. So how just is that? How fair is that is one of my ongoing questions. All right, we're going to take a little break. We've, we've flown through a lot of material here. So let's just go to your questions. So questions coming up. Um, you're describing this as uh, a distortion. I maybe it's a uh, Thornburg, but uh, Zornberg, but as a distortion of mankind to have, or a distortion of God to have children according. Um, to them, according to uh, this whole question of of the children, the children being of the mm -hmm. of the sons of God, or 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 the children being of man uh, rather than of God in the likeness of man. This is a um, challenging, I guess. It's it's like God is not omniscient. God did not set it up all right it's not going correctly mm -hmm. and that's um disturbing is that really what you're saying well it's one of the possibilities you know i think that what we're going to see with the, the noah story is a god who is capable of deep emotion a god who is capable of regret remorse um so when you're saying that god has not necessarily set everything up yes i think that that's a, a definite possibility and how do we feel about that? You know, we like to say that we, especially as Latter-day Saints, we believe in a God who progresses. And I think that's a really important and beautiful part of our theology. Um, but if it means that genocide has to happen before God makes progress, that's a little problematic. Yeah, maybe related to that, um... Yeah, I'm. I, I'm thinking about the, like the distortion is is that the children are mini me's rather than something actually of 
God. So could you maybe explain a little bit more about kind of what that thought is? Well, I can try. I think the Bible is going out of its way by saying um, when Adam has Seth, that Adam begets Seth in his image, according to his likeness. It says it twice in different ways. And so that's very intentional, or at least it feels very intentional. The question, though, of what it means, there's, there's no other way for human beings to have children, right? other than this way. It's not like God has said, here are five options and I would like you to prefer, prefer you to choose this you know, option B and you chose D and darn you. Um, there's just the one way. So what that means is not entirely clear, I, do, I don't think. And what we'll see when we get toward, toward the end of the flood narrative is that God is becoming more... Uh, I I don't know, at peace with the idea that human beings are going to sin. It's just going to be an endemic feature of humanity. There's nothing to be done about that. Human beings really don't change that much on account of the flood. And that's interesting. Uh, Jenna, there's uh, several questions that are asking about the language, the phrases sons of God and daughters of men and wonder if what you take from that difference in language and whether it's translated differently in different places, but uh, the sons of God imply something positive and daughters of men, something negative. Uh, Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, this passage is a big mystery. So, you know, I feel like I don't have any right to say, here's what it means because I don't know. It does seem to me that, this is emphasizing a power differential. And it also seems to me that it's emphasizing that this is not initiated by humankind, these you know, Congress with heavenly beings. Um, so far in the book of Genesis, we have seen God in the company of the heavenly host. And that heavenly host has been referred to in a couple of different ways. And so the one thing that is pretty clear is that sons of God has to do with God. You know, it's not just here are some rando dudes that, you know, don't have anything to do with the Lord we've been dealing with who are coming, you're, they're going rogue and they're coming to earth and, you know, raping women. It's not that simple. Uh, they are described very clearly as being sons of God. And one of the things that Zornberg points out here is that God from the time of, of, uh, the fall of Eden and and the exile from Eden up to now has essentially been absent from anything to do with human sexuality. And that was an interesting observation to me, you know, going through the Cain and Abel material and all of that. um, God is not involved in procreation. God is not involved. It's not like Abraham and Sarah. That's a lot later where God is, you know, getting directly involved in people having children. And so the first thing that we hear about human procreation is this, sons of God coming in, choosing among the daughters of men because they considered them to be fair. Yeah, so this is all really interesting. (laughs) And I'm thinking about um, kind of agency as the marker, you know, that's that's, that's differentiated here. So the sons of God, the the men have agency, the women do not. um, And maybe... Uh, you know, also thinking about, um, you know, that, that earlier scripture where um, the image of God is male and female, but that mm-hmm. image of female has been lost. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, well, that's interesting. <laughs> I mean, that's a really interesting thought. And maybe if we were to extrapolate from that part of what is sinful, even though the Bible is not saying this explicitly, but that this is not in any way respecting the imageness of women. Yeah, yeah. So, Jenna, um, first of all, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So there's several questions here on, on the question of the, the historical nature of this. How is, the, is, is this historically trustworthy? What does this say about our ability to trust God? And rather than ask that question, um, is this historical? I, I would like to ask, 
if you just shift the way that you read it and, and not read it in order to try to get at history, but read it as a way to try to get at something else, mm-hmm. what is the something else mm-hmm. that, uh, right. that as narratives, as stories, as literature, you know, let's just assume that, that whatever historicity may be here, the point of these stories is not to convey history. What's mm-hmm. the point? Great question. That's such a good question. And it, there will be a little bit on this, but let me expand on it before we get to the Noah part. Brueggemann talks about this quite a lot. He's very adamant that this is not intended to be recoverable history. It is true that there are flood narratives in multiple cultures in the ancient Near East. And it's very interesting to sort of look and see how do they differ from the flood narrative that we have here? How does the main character differ from the main characters of these other flood stories? And that's all great. But what he is arguing is that the point of Genesis is to teach us about this particular God, the God of Israel and the God of covenant. This is very much about covenant, what is expected between in this relationship between God and humanity, and specifically what is expected in this relationship between God and this family, which is set up with Genesis 5. You know, this is a really specific and particular story. Does that help to answer the question about what the point is? Yeah. And and it's not even just what, what can we learn about God? It's also, what do we learn about how God changes from the beginning of the story to the end of the story? Well, Jenna, and that's, that's, I know that's in the, that's where you're going, but this is, if you take this as story about God, about the nature of God, and that's one way to read it. There, this is challenging in the sense that it is God mourning that will come, um, God repenting, God um, Mm -hmm. setting things up in a way that necessitates a genocide. It's, Mm -hmm. it's It's a much less than omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, God in mm-hmm. this image, in this structure? Is, is, is this a story of what we should think about God or think, uh, put it that way? Is it a story about what we should think about God? In the end, I actually find the Noah narrative to be very hopeful, despite the intensely problematic, uh, terrible thing that God has done here. Um, because God changes. And in the end, to me, the the idea that God can weep, as we see from uh, the Enoch story, that God has a heart, as the Genesis story keeps emphasizing again and again, that God is moved when Noah uh, makes a sacrifice of of burnt offering, which is a repentance sacrifice at the end of this, uh, when the floodwaters recede, You know, the Bible goes out of its way to say that that moves God's heart, which is very interesting. This is not the story of a removed, um, you know, distant, impersonal God. This is a story of an up close and personal God for better and for worse. It is a dangerous God to be around. It is a dangerous God to love. And I think there are so many very problematic aspects of this relationship and this behavior. But it's also a really human story in the end. So is, is there a sense, do you think, that the stories, rather than showing the evolution of God, show the evolution of a human understanding of God? Yes, that's an excellent way of putting it. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we should go back and see what happens with poor Noah. Let's see where we're at. 208. All right, we're going to fly through some material here. I couldn't go through this story without putting in a plug for my hometown. So if you've ever been to Cincinnati within the last decade or so, you know that we have something uh, south of the border, south of the Ohio River in Kentucky, called the Creation Museum, which is an answer to evolution. And it is a, a, a biblical literalist response to evolution. And as part of this, this, the museum has been extremely successful. And as part of it, 
the founder decided to rebuild the Ark and have it be called the Ark Encounter. So it's kind of equal part Bible amusement park and uh, devotion, pilgrimage destination. I've been to the Creation Museum. Uh, for, <laughs> that's a story. And I've not yet been to the Ark Encounter. But I'm fascinated by the idea that for some reason, this story has become so present for people. There are thousands of stories in the Hebrew Bible, characters, interesting things that happen. Why this one, right? Why is this one, so, ha, has it so captivated people's imagination that we want a tangible, walkable experience where we can feel that we're part of the story? I don't have an answer to that question, but I think it's important to think about what is it about the Noah narrative that has been so enduring why do we gravitate toward this story? All right, some opening observations. I drew heavily from uh, Zornberg in the first half, and I'll get to her again in a minute, but wanted to look at some of what Brueggemann is saying here about Noah and this story. The first part is, like we said in the uh, chat, lots of flood parallels with other ancient Near Eastern texts. He makes a point of saying that's really not the most important aspects. There are also texts in which these two things are twinned, just like they are in our story. Creation and flood occur together, or flood and recreation, starting over. You might be familiar with what is called the documentary hypothesis of, of uh, particularly Genesis, but other parts of the Torah, four or possibly five redactors who are putting their own stamp on the story, at least two of them are represented in the flood narrative. So if you're interested in that, um, you know, Brueggemann is not as interested in that as some of the more technical commentaries, but it is kind of interesting to think about this story as something that has been received and then redacted by multiple people with you know, agenda is probably too strong a word, but their own emphases, the things that they think are most important. Brueggemann makes a point of saying that we tend to focus on the wrong things. How big was the ark? How many cubits was it? You know, how many days were they in? How many animals were there? You know, we, we have this wonderful Sunday school idea of everyone coming two by two. It's a little more complicated than that. It's, I believe it was the unclean animals that are done two by two. And then the clean animals are actually seven pairs of each of the clean animals. Um, but that's not the point of the story. And the, the idea that we sort of fixate on these questions about uh, the specifics of the experience, maybe we're not getting to the real point of the story, which as we've talked about is really about how God changes throughout this experience and how the relationship between God and humanity changes. And Brueggemann is very adamant that the Noah cycle in these chapters of six through nine is intended to reverse the order of the Adam cycle. So we're starting with exile and we're moving back toward union with God. We're moving back toward a sense of not a paradise. We're not in Eden. We're not returning to Eden, but of sort of a mutual understanding where our roles are clear. So what he says here is that the focus of the story is not on the flood itself, but upon the change that's wrought in God. And that is that the change is what makes possible the new creation. So one of the more problematic aspects of this very problematic story of God wiping out the human race is that Noah has nothing to say about it. And Zornberg is particularly disturbed about that. She says that Noah says not a word from the beginning to the end of the flood. So God talks to Noah a couple of times before the flood begins. God is very specific about what's going to happen. You need to build this ark and here's how big you should make it. You need to come out of this with your family and representatives of these animal species. And then each time Noah simply does what the Lord commanded. There's no record here that Noah did anything else. I mean, we have pop culture representations of 
like Russell Crowe going out and trying to save people and trying to preach that this is going to happen and everybody thinks he's crazy. We want to believe that Noah prayed for his neighbors. We want to believe that Noah went out and preached and risked terrible derision and uh, ridicule for this. There's no record that any of that actually happened. The only thing that the Bible tells us that Noah did was Noah obeyed God, Noah built the ark, Noah gathered up the animals, Noah went in the ark, and that was it, right? And there's also really nothing about how Noah felt about it, only that he acquiesced. Zornberg says that the impact of Noah's silent acquiescence in the destruction of the world is devastating. I found that line in her commentary to be particularly interesting. And so I started just doing a little reading about her. And that was fascinating to me. You know, biblical commentators, just like everyone else, approach the text through the lens of our own experience. I mean, I'm not a biblical commentator, but they do, right? And autobiography does affect how we approach the story. So what I learned about her is that uh, her parents were, her father was a rabbi in Vienna in the 1930s. She's way older than she looks. She looks amazing, right? But she's actually almost 80. And uh, she, her, her, so her father was the rabbi in Vienna when the Anschluss happened in 1938 and Hitler and his troops came in and essentially took over Austria without any protest almost overnight. There was just very little resistance in Austria. And that was the experience of her immediate family. Okay, so think about that. You're a biblical commentator writing about the Noah story. And of course, you are going to be bothered that Noah doesn't seem to care that this genocide is going to happen all around him, that all of his neighbors are going to die, that he and his family are going to be saved. That appears to be enough for Noah, just that his family is going to make it. At least that's what the text says. We don't know what Noah was thinking, but according to the text, all we know is that he obeyed God. When I learned this about Zornberg, I was fascinated. So her family did escape, uh, her own immediate family. Her father got a job teaching Jewish children who were refugees in London and then became the, he the head rabbi of Scotland. And that's where uh, Zornberg grew up. And she studied Torah with her father every day as a child. And then as an adult, became a professor of English literature, a specialist on uh, George Eliot, which I thought was pretty interesting. And then began as a mother to, uh, she's an Orthodox Jew. She uh, was a professor before she had children and then she quit her job but she continued to teach Torah to women and in these kind of small groups teaching Torah to women and has built a, a following slowly. And now she is world famous for what she did, but the depth of her understanding and her understanding of human psychology is one of the most amazing things that she brings to the text. I think that's really important for understanding how she is understanding this particular part of the story. Why does Noah say nothing? And she says it doesn't have to be this way, right? Because we have examples within Genesis and Exodus of people who did argue with God and won. So Abraham, when he finds out that God is going to destroy one city, uh, not all of human race, just one city, goes toe to toe with God and says, well, yeah, you know, what if there are 50 people and there are 50 righteous people in Sodom? Are you going to destroy that? What if there are even just 10? righteous people in Sodom. And Abraham kind of shames God and said, you know, God, the optics of this are bad for you. Like, this is not a good look for you, that you would be so vengeful and so petty. This is not a good look for you. Moses, Moses is having this uh, wonderful experience, this uh, on, on getting the, the Ten Commandments. Meanwhile, the people are down below building a golden calf because they are so disgusted with you know what God has done, and they just want that security of having an idol. God is furious. God wants to wipe them all out as vengeance. And Moses says, mm, no, let's not do that. Moses talks him down. So armed with that, Zornberg says, why didn't Noah do anything? What Noah was facing was so much worse, right? Noah is looking at the destruction of all of humanity plus all creation, right? except for those few things that are in the ark 
all of the animals are going to die, all of the plants are going to die, all of the birds are going to die, everything is going to die, and yet Noah says nothing. All right, I've preached my sermon. <laughs> Here endeth the lesson about Noah's lack of moral courage. But it reminded me of this pretty famous saying. Um, this is from a Lutheran pastor who was in Germany in the 1930s and didn't speak out because he started as started the 30s in, as an anti-communist and Hitler came into power and he said, well, Hitler wants to get rid of communists and so do I, so here we go. And then only gradually realized the terrible evil that he had signed on for. So he, he was in prison during the war, he did survive the war and he spent the rest of his life regretting his inaction and his lack of moral courage in, in recognizing the truth when it was right in front of him. So that's something to think about with the Noah story. We present, I think in Mormon circles, we present Noah as a fairly easy hero. And it's not that simple for me, not at all. Jenna, could we talked about seeing this as a, as a, as a change in how we understand God. But can we also see this narrative? I, I love the uh, Abraham and, and Moses references um, as, a, as an, an evolution in how man deals with God, how human beings deal with God. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a progression there. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a good point. I mean, Noah is the guinea pig, right? Noah is the test case. Maybe if you're Moses and you have knowledge that Abraham did this and survived, you're a little more likely to speak out. I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. Okay, so the, the meta questions about the flood, what was the point of all of this? What was the point of this genocide? And did it change anything? And then my burning question is why in the world do we think that this story is great to teach to children? <laughs> Somebody please explain this to me because, uh, wow, if you really dig into the story, everything's here all of the troubling, the most troubling aspects of the, the human divine interaction, which makes the story fascinating and so juicy and so interesting to talk about. But maybe that's something that you grow into and don't want to, you know, have your Sunday school say, yes, yeah, you know, God did destroy everybody, but isn't it awesome, right? You know, there was, there was a reason for that. Well, was there a reason for that? Okay, so let's look at two different things. The first is what happens to Noah after the flood. And the second is what happens to God. This is what Brueggemann was saying is the most important. And then I think we are done with my uh, formal remarks. Okay, the first thing that's important to know about Noah is that everything's coming full circle at the end of the Noah story. Remember that whole connection between Adam and earth and then the flood comes and essentially literally wipes away earth. And so there is this cleansing of earth um, in all of its problematic context. But Noah is going to bring us back to earth. It's interesting that his first act uh, in, in building his new life is to plant a vineyard, okay? He's going to be a winemaker. He's going to till the ground, which again represents his role as the new Adam. He's also got post-traumatic stress disorder and who wouldn't, right? Uh, and I think Zornberg does a beautiful job of just trying to understand the psychology of Noah. Um, one of the stories that I don't think is in the Come Follow Me curriculum is when Noah gets drunk and curses his kids. I, if it's in there, somebody correct me, but I'd be surprised if we tell that part of the story. Um, so Noah makes this vineyard and then he drinks of his own wine, falls asleep and something happens with his sons and he wakes up and he is very upset and he blesses two of them and he curses one of them. This also is a recapitulation of the history that we've seen so far, blessing some children, cursing other children. And it's even a recapitulation of what God has done with God's children. So that's a very interesting kind of big picture perspective of what is going on with Noah. Noah is, in my mind, a, a very sympathetic character by the end of the story. However much he can be indicted, and I think Zornberg is right to do this, for never speaking up to try to protest to God that what God was doing was wrong. 
Noah does not have an easy and happy life after, after the um, flood. And if God was disappointed with God's children, Noah is also disappointed with his children. So what happens to God? This, according to Brueggemann, is the most important part of the story. And also Zornberg, I think here they, they both really agree. She says, after the flood, God looks with new, almost inexplicable tolerance on the very problem of intrinsic evil that had precipitated destruction just a year before. Now, when you get to this part of the Come Follow Me, uh, in the Come Follow Me curriculum, which I think is in two weeks, take a look at this passage, because I think it's so interesting. Basically, God acknowledges the heart of humankind it sucks. You know, it's not going to change. Nothing is going to change. And God is okay with that. That's the surprising thing. God has recognized, oh, wow, you know, this whole uh, genocide thing didn't work. It didn't change anything. And so in response, God changes. Brueggemann says, humankind is hopeless. Creation has not changed. But God resolves that, that he will stay with, endure, and sustain the world notwithstanding the sorry state of humankind. This is a real turning point in the book of Genesis. So human beings are not going to be obedient. Human beings are not going to keep the covenant, but God does after the flood, right? That's why this is considered to be a turning point. Um, that's not to say that God isn't going to mess up in the future. And that's one of the beauties of the Old Testament as well is that it's fairly unstinting at looking at God's mistakes as well as human mistakes. We don't really teach that part <laughs> that often because it's disturbing to think of God making mistakes and God making uh, amends for them. We don't really want to think about that. So what Brueggemann winds up with is that this story shows us the deep pathos of God. And here is an interesting thing, a final note that falls back on that whole male and female thing that I mentioned at the beginning. The verb that is used to describe the pain that God experiences about the flood and about human ongoing sin is the same word that is used to curse Eve with the pain of childbearing. So God is pained by what his children have done. Eve is pained in childbearing. Um, that's a really interesting twist, an unexpected little thing. He says it's also used for the state of toil from which Noah will deliver humanity. So God is experiencing pain as well as humankind. But then there's a rainbow. So that is the end of my uh, formal remarks, and we can open it up for questions. Um, and I'm sure we will have questions, but we also have, uh, we're also near an hour. So I think we should um, try to be, uh, short here in so that we can so that we can have a closing at about an hour. Um, Rebecca, Michael, I, uh, Dan, Catherine, you're still with us. Um, go ahead, but I'm going to wrap us pretty quickly. So I'm thinking about this um, kind of the what's ha what's happening here um and and it strikes me that noah is obedient and even the obedience doesn't like the obedience is not the answer right to creating some um to overcoming human humanness um and sin does that make sense um yeah i mean noah is not christ uh, their, yeah. their even perfect obedience here is not going to save humanity. Yeah. And, it, and in fact, you know, the juxtaposition of these other alternatives with, you know, Abraham and Moses and their pleading, um, you know, become even more stri striking, um, you know, thinking about that mm -hmm. anyway. Um, Folks are talking about kind of the lessons for parents in all of this. Um, I, uh, one of the things that, that I'm getting out of these questions is, is that if you take, if you try to take this 
as as recoverable history, as literal history, um, it's very problematic. If you take it as what is this story telling us? What is it teaching us? What were the narrators intending? That's a, a way to put this all together. Mm -hmm. um, maybe for later discussion, that also puts us back into the um, LDS, Moses um, endowment stories, which have the same kind of problem that if they are taken as literal recoverable history, they put us back into challenges. But if they are taken as what is this story teaching us? I, that's a, a lead into maybe a long conversation, but mm -hmm. uh, you're nodding, Jenna, like you have a response. Well, not that I haven't already stated. I don't think I have anything new to add, except to say that when we dig deeper into this story, beyond those things that Brueggemann was saying are really not important. It's a fascinating story. And it, it particularly as a parent, you know, how it is really interesting to us to think of ourselves as kind of mini gods to our kids and how we behave in that role. It's very troubling. Um, Jenna, would you like to give us a wrap-up statement, or maybe you did for Brueggemann, but, uh, but um, would you do that? And then we'll, uh, um, then I'll ask Michael if he's got music for us. Well, I don't have much of a wrap-up statement, but here's something about the music that Michael has chosen. Uh, Michael suggested this song, and then I remembered that this had been playing in my house when I was a kid. And it's so funny. It's a great song. So we started with very serious stuff and we destroyed all of humanity, but this is a great song. So I hope you'll stay for it. Stan, can we ask you to offer closing prayer? Yes, yes. Dear Father in heaven, we're grateful for this lesson and discussion. We thank thee for the important and relevant insights for the truths that were shared and the spirit that we felt. Please help us understand and internalize the teachings that were shared today by Jana Reese. Help us become better people. Please help us pay more attention to the scriptures and to the opportunities around us to stand up to intolerance, to care more and to progress in our understanding and perception of God and to become more Christ-like and learn to love and serve those around us as Christ did. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.